Again, welcome to Boulder Mountain on this New Year's Eve. My name's Kyle. We're, we're a church that's dedicated to making disciples as we help people find and follow Jesus. We're an independent church, Bible church, and if you'd like more information, I invite you to stop by the blue tent out there and, and we can answer any questions you might have. I would love to meet you if we've not met. Uh, thanks for showing up today. I'm going to read Psalm 103. Earlier I read it in a paraphrase. This is in the English Standard Version. Psalm 103, the Psalm of David. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Some of us were doing that this morning. Everything that's in me, I'm, I'm blessing God. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit. Anybody been in the pit before? Who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good, so that your youth is renewed like that of eagles. God sees you today. I don't know where you're at in your life, if what brought you into the room here today. I want you to know that God loves you. And God, through his son Jesus, is offering a trade today. I believe Jesus makes trades. And this passage in the first five verses of Psalm 103 clearly explains that to us. My wife and I have our family, started out as our family, now it's turned to just my wife and I. We have a annual tradition. And uh, a lot of our traditions kind of come out this time of year, right? Around the holidays. Well, this tradition isn't very fun, but it's something we do New Year's Eve weekend every year. We're from the Midwest originally. I'm in, in the Midwest, homes have basements. And for a number of years in our garage, our garage gets cluttered as the year goes on. And the later in the year it gets, the more cluttered and unorganized our garage gets. So 20 years ago or so, we decided that New Year's Eve weekend would be the time we clean out and organize our garage. How fun does that sound? <laughs> for, for many years, the girls were required to participate, and so they would, they would give us, you know, we'd give us an hour. Give us, then it became, give us a half hour. And now it's literally we text them pictures of their stuff <laughs> and they tell us if they want it kept or not. So they're all young adults and we're storing, they each have a compartment in the garage of their stuff that we're, we're keeping. And then there's boxes that my wife and I argue over, things that I grew up with, things that she grew up with, like my old trophies, uh, both of them. <laughs> And she's like, why are we holding on to this stuff? And I'm like, this is, this is my Hall of Fame right here. You know? It's covered in dust. And so that's what we did on Friday of, of this past week. We spent all day in, in the garage, and it feels so good to organize and clean up. We take inventory. I made a number of trips to Goodwill and to some other friends. We were donating some things, and who needs this and who needs that? It felt so good to purge. The same is true in our spiritual life. God gives us opportunities. The way he's created the world and the system, and we have opportunities to renew our spiritual life and to take inventory, to spend some time, if you haven't done so yet, to do so today and to reflect on 2023, the good the bad, the ugly, the new friendships. I made a list of new friendships. This is my first full year at Boulder Mountain, and it's a long list of new friends. Many of you made the list. I'm so grateful for you. <laughs> you, you, you made the list of God, through his graciousness, gave me new friends this year. Uh, I'm so grateful for that. And I, I think through the answered prayer, if you keep a journal, you can look at all the prayer requests that have shared. We're good at sharing prayer requests, but did we stop to reflect on answered prayer? And God, as many prayer requests we gave, you, you answered each and every one of them in your own way, in your own time. And it's good to reflect and take inventory 
What things do I need to continue to do? I saw fruit from, and I want to continue to do that. Maybe there are some things that uh, need to stop. We need to stop doing some things. God has given us, he says in Lamentations, new mercies every day. And I would make the case every week, there's a, there's a new week. Every day, there's a new day. Every month, it's a new month. Every year, there's a new year for us to take inventory and reflect back and purge some things, donate some things, get rid of some things, throw it in the garbage. And Jesus offers all of us today a trade. Did you catch it in Psalm 103? The trade is, it begins, if you're taking notes today, the trade is first, sin. Sin. We were all born into sin and we've lived a life of sin. And Jesus says, I see that, I know that, and I still care about you and I love you. I'm willing to trade your sin for what? Psalm 103, sin for a crown. Jesus says, I'll take your sin, I'll in place of your sin, I'll give you a crown. Psalm 8, verses 5 through 8 says that he will place a crown of glory over each and every one of us. Not ascribed honor and worth, but given to us by our creator. You have infinite worth and value because you were created by a holy God. He takes our sin and what does he give us and replace? A crown. Sin. The second is sickness. Unhealth. That could be physical, it could be mental, it could be uh, poor decisions, poor boundaries that we've had in our life. He takes our sickness, it could be physical sickness, and he replaces it with contentment. Contentment. Peace. And the last one is he gives us physical health. Foolishness. Uh, in my notes originally I had stupidity. So just, just to be clear, sin, sickness, stupidity, because I paid the dumb tax this year. Long list of decisions I made where I paid the dumb tax. Anybody else? I don't want to continue that. And so he said, I'll trade you. I'll trade you that. The dumb tax, stupidity for life. Where did you experience life this past year? Replicate that. Do more of that. Where you experience growth, do more of that. Lean into that. Most of us of it can testify to the fact that most of our life change has been outside of our comfort zones. We stepped forward. We did some really difficult things and, and hard things. Jesus wants to trade you all three of those or one of those, whatever the Holy Spirit's speaking to you about right now. What area of your life do you want to stop? Like, I, I don't want to continue to live like this anymore. I made some poor decisions. I, there may be some addictions. There may be some behaviors that are not just impacting you. They're impacting, there's a ripple effect. Everybody else in your life is feeling it. And you're saying, enough. I, I can't do this anymore. Jesus is saying, I'll trade you that for a crown. And it comes to our relationship with Jesus. It begins with Grace. He, our salvation is given to us. We don't earn it. There's nothing we can do to work for it or get it. It's a gift that he gives to each and every one of us. But then in my relationship with him, after he's redeemed me and called me his own, now I want to get to know him. I want to grow in that relationship. And it requires, that requires effort. Peter says to work out your salvation. What would that look like in 2024 for you and I to work out our salvation? What are some steps that God's asking you to take that you've never taken before? What are some behaviors, some maybe habits, some hurts that have been there for years that you know is there and it's affecting you and you, you haven't dealt with it yet? Jesus says, I'll, I'll, I want to trade that. And I want to give you the best year of life you've ever experienced. Not in terms of material things, because it may be a really difficult year, but an opportunity to experience peace in the presence of God like never before. 
From head to toe, I bless his holy name. Many believe David is at the end of his life when he's writing this. He's keenly aware of the redemption of his sin. That wasn't always the case with David. But at the end of his life, as an older man, he's more aware of his frailty. I turned 50 this year, and my wife has told me many times this year, you're not 25 anymore. (laughs) I'm like, I'm double that. I'm two 25-year-olds. But I'm beginning to realize, boy, I would love to mount up like wings like eagles. I've read a lot about eagles this week. Man, they're, they're impressive. Their eyesight's impressive. Uh, eagles, I learned, are not bald. <laughs> uh, I, was, I was trying to relate to eagles, but <laughs> f- fell short. But they glide. They, they glide. Read about eagles when you get home today. David says, you can, you can live like an eagle. You can have energy. You are, you are always young in his presence, that message translation says. You're always young in his presence. Not physically, but he bestows upon you and I energy to experience things that on our own we wouldn't be able to experience. This past year, in, in January of this past year, I challenged the church to, to take... Um, to consider being a part of what we would call a step study through a program called Celebrate Recovery. And as your pastor, I want you to know, I'm never going to ask the church to do something I'm not willing to do. Just so if you ever are aware, you hear about a program or you hear about an event, uh, I want to go through that with you. And so I had an opportunity to go through a step study. It's as long as it takes to birth a baby. So it's about nine months. So we started, and we had a men's step study, and we had a women's step study. And Celebrate Recovery is for each and every one of us in the room, because we all have hurts, habits, and hang-ups. They look different. Yes, it includes addictions and alcohol and things like that, but so many other things. It could be shopping, it could be gambling, it could be anger, it could be pride, it could be lust. It's a long list. Your list is probably different than my list, but... We all have hurts, habits, and hang-ups. In fact, there's probably uh, two types of people in the entire world, those in recovery and those in denial. And I want you to know Boulder Mountain Community Church is the place for you to be in recovery and to admit it. And after you admit it, to still feel welcome, you are accepted here. God loves us as we are, where you are today, and he loves you too much to leave you there. And so... I'm so proud, the women's step study today that finished up, they were willing to share their, what we would call a mini-money, a mini-money. It's a a short testimony of what God has done in their life, and they will be, really, they will be the sermon today. I believe this is ultimately what church was designed to be, of people testifying to the work of God in their life, and others finding encouragement and hope from that. So I'm so proud of, of these women as they come to the stage. I'm going to invite these five women now as they come on up. Typically, as, as they come up, let me just share. Typically, they would share their testimony or their mini-money in a Celebrate Recovery program. Well, we don't have a Celebrate Recovery program yet at Boulder Mountain. It's By God's grace, if that's what he would like us to launch, we may do that in the future. So we had a conversation about, would you be willing to share this with the church as a whole? Now think about the courage to share their testimony with all of you, with what they've worked through. So I'm I'm really proud of these five women who've spent nine months meeting consistently, working through different things. They're going to share with you. And I pray that as they share that you would be encouraged and the Holy Spirit might prick your heart in some things that he might want to do and refine in, in you as, as well as within me. And so uh, thank you for, for being willing to share. Um, we do have children's ministry for children birth through fifth grade. I believe they've left the room already, but just a heads up as they share their testimony, adult testimonies, that if there are any children left in the room, there's an opportunity to head to uh, children's ministry. All right. That would be helpful, wouldn't it? Marisol. 
Good morning, Boulder Mountain Church. I told myself I wasn't going to be nervous, but man, this is a full house. <laughs> so anyway, my name is Marcel. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus, and I'm a sinner who loves Jesus. Um, I also struggle with codependency. I was born in the Philippines and immigrated to Hawaii with my family when I was nine years old. I have two wonderful, hardworking parents who wanted nothing more than a better life for me and my siblings. I have an older brother, an older sister, than me, the middle child, and my younger sister. And I do possess some of the characteristic of a middle child, just to name a few. Um, feeling overshadowed and often be the first one, the first sibling to move out of the house. So fast forward. As soon as I turned 18, I met a guy. We moved to Arizona. Then four years later, we moved to Denver, Colorado. I was in a very abusive and toxic relationship. I was so broken, I did not know what to do. My friend of mine from work invited me to a church, and they had just started a ministry called Celebrate Recovery. So I was like, what is Celebrate Recovery? So, you know, I'm a Google queen, so I Googled it. So it says, it's a Christ-centered ministry that gives people the resources and relationship to help find a new way of living. This ministry is for anyone who's struggling with past or hurt, current hurts, habits, or hang up. Whether they are affecting their own life or lives of those around them including but not exclusive to high anxiety, codependency, that would be me, compulsive behaviors, sex addiction, financial dysfunction, drug and alcohol addiction, and eating disorders. But my God, he's so kind and patient that he made me realize that I'm like his kintsugi bowl. I don't know if you guys heard of the kintsugi bowl is a Japanese philosophy that value of an object is not in its beauty, but in its imperfection, and that this imperfection are something to celebrate, not hide. No matter how broken I was, God is eager to do his kintsugi bowl in me. So 2 Corinthians 12, 19 says, and the beauty of his work in you will make a difference in the lives of those around you. This scripture is so true for me because seven years ago, I started praying and asking God for Celebrate Recovery to start at the church I grew up in, in Pearl City, Hawaii. That's in Oahu, just to clarify that. And for my family to get involved, especially my brother, because I'm sure everyone remembers what happened in 2020. My brother called me to tell me the good news that LCC, it's called the Leeward Community Church in Oahu, was starting Celebrate Recovery. And he, was, and he will be starting a step study and four other men from the church. So Hawaii, and when Hawaii finally opened, I was able to go home and they had no restriction 2021. Um, they had asked me to share my testimony. Well, this is the church I grew up in, and it's the same size as this. Um, so but when I did share my testimony, it was mostly people in my family it was in the audience. So I was really nervous. But God answers prayers. Because then this October, I was able to go back home again and I invited two of my girlfriends who I met at Celebrate Recovery, and they were able to, um, one led, test, led the worship and one shared her testimony, and we're all from Arizona. So that was a wow God moment. And today is another wow God moment for me because um, the ladies you see over here behind me have worked really hard and completed their step study. So thank you ladies for letting me co-lead. I pray that you will continue to grow in your recovery and remember it will work if you make it work. Thank you for letting me share.
I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ, and my name is Barb. Hi, Barb. I'm not an alcoholic. <laughs> In 2015, I attended my first Celebrate Recovery meeting at Mission Church. After many requests from my best friend to check it out, I finally gave in and came. I didn't know what she thought was wrong with me, but I just, you know, needed her to be quiet, so I went to the meeting. <laughs> She's here today, too. I attended the meeting and was immediately in awe of what the people in the room appeared to have. I couldn't relate to their ability to speak so transparently and vulnerably in front of a large room full of people. The healing they spoke of and trust they had in our Lord, I didn't understand it, but I knew I wanted it. In the song Shine by Newsboys, it says, shine. Make them wonder what you've got. Make them wish they were not on the outside looking board. It's been eight years. And I can honestly say that Celebrate Recovery saved my marriage back in 2015. It was while I went through my first step study that I learned that I had my own character defects to work on and I needed to quit focusing on my spouses. It was during those first few months that I realized that I struggle with control and codependency. When life feels like too much or a loved one's actions set me off, I was turning to screen time, procrastinating, and or compulsive overeating as ways to cope. That year, I learned how to turn my life over to God. I got into Overeaters Anonymous and lost 70 pounds. I wish I could tell you that the step study transformed me and that I've walked a much deeper faith and lived a much healthier life ever since. While the first statement is true, life throws us curveballs, which have taught me that I need to hold on to the principles that I've learned in CR. And for me, that means continuing to attend, reworking the steps, and holding myself accountable to others while working through my hurts, hangups, and habits. It was in March of this year where I found myself at a low point. My oldest had tried to take her life, her life, and all the leaders at my company were being let go as the company had just been purchased. Both situations I had very little control over. I knew it was time to get back into a step study as my anxiety was very high. Within only a week of making this decision, I heard about a new women's step study starting and I knew it was God's timing. I remember walking into the room to a group of strangers. Even though I wasn't new to CR, I was new to everyone in the room here at Boulder. That changed quickly. As we began to work the chapters and explore the steps and principles, the transparency that can only come with like-minded group of Christian women began to develop and grow. I looked forward to Monday nights knowing I would be going to a safe place where I could be myself, speak freely about what I was going through, and not be worried that others would be judging me as they were busy walking their own journey. Since beginning the step study this year, I've lost my 101-year-old grandfather, a 31-year-old cousin to suicide. Watched my oldest deal with totaling her car and my husband left his job. 2023 hasn't been an easy year. However, I can tell you, it wasn't one of the hardest because through step study, I was giving my life to God each morning by reciting the principle three prayer. My favorite lines from that prayer are, dear God, I've tried to do it all by myself, on my own power, and I have failed. I want to daily turn my will over to you to daily seek your direction and wisdom for my life. When I ask God for his direction and power in my life, the day is always easier. I don't have to walk this life alone. By centering, on my, by centering my day on God's ways and asking for help, I've found that hard conversations are more easily handled with honesty, integrity, and care situations in life that would have pushed me over the edge have less control over my thoughts and my day. Even though I am a boss at work, it's when I make sure God is in charge that work decisions are so much clearer. I better prioritize and I'm able to sleep at night. Along with the trials that came this year, there were many blessings. I got to attend my first ever Celebrate Recovery Summit in California. It was a gift to be at Saddleback listening to Rick Warren, one of the ministry founders, 
and learning that the ministry is now making a healing impact in 68 countries and has been translated in 27 different languages. I was in awe. I can honestly say it was a retreat from my life like no other. For four days, the CR founders poured their knowledge and faith into us. I felt as light and carefree as I had when attending church camp as a teenager. I left so much of my life's baggage in California that week. For those few days, it was simply God and I walking a journey of healing, self-care, and awareness. For me, Celebrate Recovery is faith meeting self-care. It's where God's miracles happen. My secret is that I know the best self-care is found when you surround yourself with like-minded women who are also focusing on becoming a better version of themselves while growing in their walk with God. For this reason, I am glad that I have found the place that allows me to shine. If provided the opportunity, I encourage you not to sit on the outside, join a Celebrate Recovery program, make them wonder what you've got, and shine. Thank you for letting me share. Hi, I'm Cindy. Hi, Cindy. Hi, Cindy. <laughs> and I'm a grateful believer in Christ. I struggle with anger, codependency, and control. I approached the step study not really knowing how I would make the changes in my life, how I would make the changes in my life. <laughs> I was on this merry-go-round of setting expectations, getting disappointed, getting frustrated, are sometimes getting very angry. These expectations would hurt, hurt relationships around me. It would hurt how I viewed myself. I would have negative thoughts like, oh, you're so stupid. But most of all, it would replace my need for God, our Lord and Savior. Just like how I first approached CR with what I can do, I failed to see what God was doing or has already done. That God was stretching and strengthening me, protecting me and giving me rest. I can't say this is very easy as I have a very controlling nature. My family probably would. <laughs> um, even when I was younger, I would plot out a plan and expect everything to be exactly the way I wanted it to be. Now, it's okay to have dreams and responsibility or to have goals, but to be so arrogant to not lay them before God is forgetting whose story we really are part of. This consuming desire to be in control reflected in my education, which learning wasn't a natural thing for me, yet I demanded no less than an A. This drove my mom crazy because I would have fits of rage. <laughs> In my career, I worked long hours to achieve only self-satisfaction, but neglecting self-care. This carried into my relationships, into my family, losing family, losing a child. But I don't have control. I don't truly have the power to change my life, but God, who is ultimately in control, does and learning to sit and let God drive Jesus says his yoke is easy his burden is light I'm learning this in the step study there are eight principles that are based on the Beatitudes the first one rings clearly for me realizing I am not God I admit that I am powerless to control my tendency and to do the wrong things, that my life is unmanageable. This comes from Matthew 5, 3. Happy are those who know they are spiritually poor. It's hard to be spiritually poor when you can't see how rich God's love is. Even to love yourself. It doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian, unless you are willing to let go of the will and let God drive, 
your struggles will continue to go round and round like a merry-go-round. Today I have victory over past pain and struggles. I have freedom from negative views of myself. I'm learning to see my codependency tendencies to want to fix everything. And the Lord is working and giving me peace over frustration and anger. Being part of this group of women has been the best part and it came to perfect timing in my life. It's a safe group. No one, there's no judgment. No one's trying to fix each other. We're just surrendering to God's perfect will. Thank you. Hello, I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ. I have freedom over childhood hurts and addiction and struggle with fear and anxiety. My name is Jennifer. I did not grow up in a Christian home. We were told that Christmas was Jesus' birthday and Easter was the day he resurrected. That was the extent of what we were taught about Jesus. Both my parents struggled with addictions to alcohol and drugs. My mom was also addicted to gambling and struggled with mental illness. While my family loved each other, it was not something we expressed in words or affection. Showing emotion was showing weakness. Growing up, family gatherings, such as birthdays and holidays, always turned into a party night where the adults would get drunk and us kids would sneak around and steal leftover drinks. <clears throat> By high, my high school years were a blur. I was a good student and was able to get decent grades. Teachers and other adults would often comment about how great of a kid I was. Unfortunately, no matter how hard I try, these words never came from my parents. The truth was I was depressed and suicidal, and I had found that drinking and smoking marijuana helped to numb those feelings. By the time I was 20, I had also found a new friend that would help me get through all the extra hours and late nights I was working to pay my own way. This friend was called cocaine. At 23 years old, three years into this addiction, I overdosed. I found myself praying to God even though I did not know him. I begged him to spare my life, that if he would get me through this, I would never use again. I did not keep my promise and would relapse several times and overdose, overdose once more before finally being able to stay sober. Tomorrow, I will have 19 years of freedom from this addiction. <laughs> In 2003, I met Blue, and after three years of dating, we were married. Blue grew up in a Christian family. However, in his struggles, he had turned away from God long before we met. His family was a complete opposite of mine. They loved God and each other, and they showed it. Family gatherings always started and ending, ended with a hug and a kiss, sometimes on the lips, which to me was really weird. <laughs> <laughs> and grace was always said before meals. When we would have struggles, my mother-in-law would encourage us to pray about this, and I would just roll my eyes and think, how is that going to help? My sister-in-law would often invite us to church, and I would go because I'm too codependent to say no. That might disappoint her. Today, I thank God for their persistence and using them to draw me in. In 2007, our life was in turmoil. We had a one-year-old little boy that was sick all the time, and the doctors had no answers. Blue had lost his job, we had our vehicle repossessed, and we were about to lose our home. I was so desperate that I finally took my mother-in-law's advice and prayed. I found myself on my knees and surrendered my life to the care and control of God. This did not mean that everything was perfect. There was still much work to be done in my life and in my heart. While I was learning to lean on God through this situation, my husband seemed to be using alcohol to get through these hard times. This would cause a huge divide between Blue and I. I was bitter and frustrated that he never seemed to be involved in our everyday lives. When he was home, he would be found in the garage drinking. He was now working at a hospital and would be on call every other week and would still drink on the days he was on call. I was fearful that he would once again lose his job or be pulled over and arrested for a DUI. We often argued over this and our marriage was headed for a divorce. In 2016, I had, I had enough and started making plans to take the boys and leave. In a last-ditch effort, I decided to check out Celebrate Recovery, a Christ-centered recovery group for those with hurts, habits, and hang-ups. I came to Celebrate Recovery because of my husband's addiction to alcohol. I wanted to know how to fix him. 
I was looking for sympathy and support for myself. I was at the end of my rope, trying to keep things under control so that my life would be stable and secure, and most importantly, so that others would not know the mess I had made of it. What I did not realize is that my life My life was being controlled by fear and that I had become controlling, manip manipulative, and depressed. I did not know who I was anymore and I was angry at God. In my codependency, I was very prideful. I saw myself as a victim, not responsible for the situations I found myself in, which made it hard for me to see how I was contributing to the growing problems in our marriage. I was encouraged to join a step study and at this point I was desperate enough to do anything. I had decided that I was going to hold off on moving out and make the decision after the step study completed. Blue was also attending CR and I wanted to give God a chance to work in his heart also. My prayer was this, I surrender my marriage to you, God. I will do the work to clean up the mess I've made of my life and allow you to work on Blue. I will, if you will let you. I want our marriage to be restored if that is your will, but if it is not, I will be okay. I would love to report that that step study fixed everything, but it did not. It did, however, help me start healing. I met women in the step study that walked alongside me, prayed for me, and with me. These women I call my God squad. They've been with me through so many hurts and heartaches. I thought I was alone in my struggles, that there was no way anyone could understand what I had gone through and the things I had done, but I was wrong. Many of these women knew my story because they had the same story. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up the other. But woe be to the one who falls alone and does not have another to help. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 10. With the healing I found in this step study, I was able to offer my grace and love to my husband. I was learning to be patient with him and with God. The reward was great. Many miracles have happened over the last few years. My marriage has been restored. I would dare to say that we're closer and happier now than we've ever been. Many in my family have turned their lives over to God, including my dad, brother, and sister-in-law. Family gatherings on my side are much like Blue's. They start with hugs, no kisses. <laughs> and Blue is asked to say grace before meals. Our children will grow up to know that they are loved by their parents and by Jesus. I will restore to you the years the locusts have eaten, Joel 2.25. Like you, like me, many of you have thought recovery is only for drug addicts and alcoholics, people whose lives seem out of control, but that's not true. Sin is addicting, and the Bible says we have all sinned. Not one of us is perfect. We have all blown it and made mistakes. We've hurt ourselves, we've hurt others, and we've been hurt by others. No matter the situation you find yourself in here, there is good news. Regardless of whether your problem is emotional, financial, relational, spiritual, or whatever you need help with, God wants to help you. He is ready and waiting for you to allow him. Thank you for letting me share. They said no, would be he no one would be here today, but I see there are plenty of people, and I'm nervous, so I'll just tell you up front, and I have to read mine from my phone because we've got a printer jam. I, my name is Marta, and I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ. I, for most of, almost everybody here who ever looked at the website or saw my testimony, they did a video of my life and how God uh, changed me. And um, let me just start to read here what I prepared. My life as an epileptic was very restrictive. I was handicapped. I lived a handicapped lifestyle for a very long time and God intervened and he um, helped me get better. But the problem was is that I didn't feel anything other than handicapped. I was still wearing that label and the title and all the negative feelings that go along with it. And this is what I wanted to show you. I brought props, everybody laughed. Um, this is a can labeled beans. It says Heinz vegetarian beans and tomato sauce. Does that 
the right label for that can? No, no, it's mislabeled. Okay, so we all are guilty of labeling things, and that means that we judge things, and we see that, and on the outside, what do you see? And you, you maybe think about that as you're growing up, and um, so what you see on the outside and how, what we feel on the inside may be based on what we were told when we were growing up. If you're told you're just like your father and it's meant to be something derogatory because it's not the image of your daddy as a child in ch your early childhood but the older man who abandoned his life, then you absorb that and that's, be that's who you label yourself as. I'm just like my father. Or they say you have the alcoholism gene and that you might never, you decide that you're never going to drink, but then you might decide, ha, huh, that's just part of my DNA, I'm gonna drink as much as possible. So you're very fortunate if you're able to decipher how to label yourself with the good labels, embrace them and pitch out the bad ones. And if you look at the cast on my leg, you say, you label that, what do you say? oh, she got injured, or it's broken, or you look at people who wear these metal tags that are because you have an affliction or you're ill, so you label that. You say, oh, they're sick, I'm glad it's not me. Um, or you're very compassionate about that. So we're not supposed to do that because it says in Romans 8.1, there's now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. So you have to think about what, who and what are you labeling and where does that come from? Where does that come from? And so throughout my life, I labeled myself self based on comparisons to others or what other people told me about myself, like that nickname as a child that stuck like glue, or you're just like my mom, and most of all, those weren't not true. So I had a bunch of those. I can't list them all because I was told I was, had a time frame of five minutes, but I'm gonna run over. But some of those labels were worthless, weak, powerless, damaged goods, lost cause, a failure. And those also had those negative labels attached with them. I was frustrated, angry, rejected, unforgivable, abused, and definitely not attractive. And I was always less than someone else because I was compa comparing myself to them all the time and associating those labels with that. So God intervened and brought me to Boulder Mountain and to Arizona. And I tried to get closer to God, but I, there was this distance in there and I wasn't quite sure where that was coming from. But it, I knew it had something to do with forgiveness and forgiveness about, especially with people who passed away in my life. There were tons of people who passed away that hurt me desperately. I'm like, how do I reconcile? How can I do this? I don't understand. And so this CR class came up and it said people who had hurts, hangups, and habits. So I thought, oh, wow, great. Another class, I'm signing up. And um, I'm thinking that this class might help me forgive everyone that ever hurt me in my life and everything would be just fine again. And that I would be so close to God, everything would be wonderful. So I signed up and what I found out was um, that what you get is tools, tools on how to deal with these hurts and then the ha resulting hangups and the habits that you form because of them. And the principles tell you to take steps to get closer to the goals. And so when you do the steps, sometimes it's a straight walk in a line or climb up steps to the top of the hill or you climb, go down the steps into your very soul, the basement of your life to get out those labels. For instance, the first thing that you do is you have to admit that you can't do anything out with, without God's help and that you realize that you are powerless to your sins that are getting you trapped in the mud. 
and then you have to confess your sins to God. So you do that, and then he wants us to take it a step farther. In James 5.16, it says, confess your sins to each other. How many people are familiar with this scripture? That you're to confess to each other so that you can pray for one another and that you can be healed. So that's basically what you do. You, you confess your sins there and you confess to each other. You get a sponsor and that sponsor supports you and helps you along the way. And then you take a moral and spiritual inventory, which is like, that's going to really expose all those horrible labels that you assigned yourself all through your life. And then as a group, you confess to one another and then you, you apply the principles to the books that change you. And after the class, I took the class for a month and the reason why I brought these is because it, they laughed at me because I said, okay, I said, I got to the first book, there's four books. And I said, this is great. I love this book and everything, but where's the part about forgiveness? And they said, laugh, they laugh, see, they're laughing. And they said, oh no, that comes at the end. It's like, oh no, oh no. <laughs> so I had to wait months to get there. I'm thinking that's what it was. And it's like, but I got stuck. I thought, okay, I'm stuck. I'm a, I committed and I'm gonna keep going. And, and I had to go through all the steps to get to the F word, the forgiveness part. <laughs> and so, um, so some were, steps were very easy, some weren't. But I learned a lot about myself, and I learned that I had mislabeled, just like this can, myself along the way, all through life. Now I have new labels. I'm grateful, I'm loved, I'm forgiven, I'm accepted, redeemed, blessed, empowered, hopeful, I'm worthy, and most of all, I'm committed to a life with Christ, and lastly, I found out that God's not finished with me yet. And I'm now I'm painfully aware of all my faults as a human and my need for him to change, to change my thoughts daily. And I found out the person that I need to forgive the most was not all those people that died, was myself. And because I mislabeled myself for years and years and years, and the only way I could see this was from, from God through the Celebrate Recovery Step Study. And I want to personally thank everybody who made this happen, all the people that brought it here, and Pastor Kyle, everybody that, from Sun Valley who are here today to listen to our many testimonies, and that my stepsisters now, I thank them for helping me and each other and I encourage anybody, if you have this opportunity, to please do this for yourself. It's life-changing, and I will never regret it. And thank you. take a moment and pray over these ladies and uh, would you join me father thank you for the work that you have done in each one of these women who shared today i pray that you would continue to do a work you are not done and i pray that that would continue in them as well as in each and every one of us here in the room in jesus name amen, amen. thank you so glad that you joined us for today's service. Let me leave you with a few next steps that you can take. Number one, let us know that you're participating online. You can make a comment there in the notes. You can send me an email or you can give the church a call. Just let us know. We'd love to add you to our email list that updates our people on what is happening in the life of the church. Number two, if there's something I can specifically be praying for you about, I can give that prayer request. I will pray for you, but I can also give that to our prayer team. A third next step that you can take, if you've been encouraged by the ministry of Boulder Mountain, even though you've maybe never been here physically, uh, let me encourage you to give. We believe that giving 
teaches us contentment. When we recognize that God's been generous to us, so at Boulder Mountain, we give first, we save second, then we live on the rest. So there's an opportunity for you to participate in giving through our church website. If there's anything else that I can be doing for you or, or Boulder Mountain can do for you by sending you resources, simply let us know. Otherwise, let me pray for you as we close our service. And so for those, Father, who are not here in the room, we recognize church is not a building we come and sit in. So wherever they are at, we know and we believe that, Jesus, you are with them. So I pray that they would sense your presence and your power. Holy Spirit, give them the wisdom to know what to do, and then give them the courage to do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you this week.